How much of a role does luck play in trading? In the long run, zero, absolutely zero. I don't think anybody winds up making money in this business because they started out lucky. If they applied appropriate risk management, they could handle the worst that came down to the pike once they were in any trade. These are quotes from The Complete Turtle Trader by Michael Koval. It showed that a method completely different than The Wall Street Journal, than Investor's Business Daily, than any fundamental information is not needed. This is not Warren Buffett. I think it definitely showed that the average person can go ahead and take a whack at this. Welcome to IG's Trading the Market podcast. I'm Victoria Scholar. The turtle traders have gone down in market folklore. The idea that a group of traders can be trained to become successful traders in markets is a hotly debated topic. Is it nature or is it nurture that makes a trader into a millionaire? The Complete Turtle Trader has been lauded as one of the best renditions of the story of the Wall Street legend known as the Prince of the Pits, Richard Dennis. Dennis firmly believed that trading was a skill that could be taught. To this end, Dennis bet his long-term partner, Bill Eckhart, that he could train a class of novices, the Turtles, to make money on the markets. Eckhart said it was not possible. Best-selling author Michael Koval, who wrote The Complete Turtle Trader, joins me now. Thanks so much for your time, Michael. Let's just start with um, a quick summary, if you can, of the book. Great story. Young guy, originally trading on the floor, giving his, father's, giving his father hand signals back in the late 60s, early 70s. Then he makes his own first million by the age of 25, makes a couple hundred million by the age of 37, now, this is 1982, 1983, so today, where it seems like everyone's a billionaire, I want people to realize that $200 million in 1982, 1983 was a lot of money. Mm. So he goes ahead, and he watches the movie Trading Places with his partner. And they walk out of the movie, and his partner's like, man, that's a, that's a crazy story. Take somebody off the street, make them wealthy. We, you know, that can never happen in the real world. I mean, like, for example, nobody could be you. You're innate, Rich. You're brilliant. And this guy, Rich, being somewhat humble, said, well, you know, I don't think that's true. I think I can train people. So they made a little bet. They went ahead and put ads in the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, et cetera, and they hired students. The students submitted an application. They answered some questions. They came in for interviews. Thousands of people responded. At the time, Richard Dennis's name was probably as big as George Soros' name, uh, the two biggest traders on the planet at the time. They ended up hiring about 20 students. They gave them about two weeks of training in quant methods. So this was no, you know, sit there by the seat of your pants, day trading, guessing, fundamental information. What's the crop report say? What are the guys on CNBC saying? None of that. This was strictly... Here are the rules. If the market does this, you do this. And so at the end of four years, this group of 20 students approximately, they made about $100 million. And so it really was this great story of nurtured, trumping nature. You can learn. Yes, and I think, today, I, I think today, like how, how in the world can someone say you can't learn today? Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, you talked a bit about how the investment philosophy is not so much based on the fundamentals. Can you talk to us a bit about what the basic investment philosophy of the book is about? Well, it's not based on the fundamentals at all. So just to be clear, it's based on price action, so momentum. So if a market is going up, you want to be long. If a market is going down, you want to be short. And you have a certain money management algorithm that says, kind of like betting in Vegas, I'm only willing to lose a certain amount of money. So if you play this game out over the long run, you're going to end up with many small losses and a few big gains. The few big gains pay for the small losses and give you the profit. It's very similar to venture capital, for example. It's the same mentality that the venture capital firms use in modern day investing today. Michael, I mean, this is a fascinating story, even if you're not a market trader. What's the key message that you wanted to convey in your book? There's a lot of messages. I think one message is kind of the self-belief. You know, can I really do this? Right? You know, if you, if you have a method, can I do it? Or 
you know, do you look at the TV and say, I could never be one of those people? I think it definitely showed that the average person can go ahead and take a whack at this. I think secondarily also, it showed that a method completely different than the Wall Street Journal, than Investor's Business Daily, than any fundamental information is not needed. This is not Warren Buffett. Now, that's no, criticism, that's no criticism of Warren Buffett, but you don't need to have the Warren Buffett insight, the balance sheet understanding, all that kind of stuff. You don't need that. So it's a, it's a very behavioral finance-minded way of making money. You really have to be disciplined and say, okay, here are the rules. I'm going to take a long position because crude oil just made a slight advance you know, its highest high in the last 50 days. I'm just making an example up. So I'm now going to take a long position in crude oil. I don't know what's going to happen next, but I'm going to take that position. So that requires a little bit of uh, faith in the overall process that, you know, you've done your homework and you know how this, this game plays out in the long run. It does require a certain amount of statistical thinking. So those are some great lessons there. It's just, it's very counterintuitive to what everyone's taught in business school, or frankly, when your local broker calls you, it's just completely opposite of that. Is there a lesson as well uh, that's about sort of the fact that we might be overcomplicating things nowadays in trading? I mean, Richard Dennis, the Wall Street legend, stuck to a few very simple rules while trading, and that earned him his fortune, like you said. In this intricate world that we live in today with computer systems, deeply complex products, algorithms, complicated fast money strategies. I mean, is there a lesson there that it's best to just keep things simple? I think all the things that you just talked about, we can politely call propaganda because really <laughs> it's just not, it's not needed. It's just not needed. I mean, for example, you just, if you want to model the great traders today, they're really looking at momentum. That's what they're looking at because they can program their computers with these simple rules that say, here's what we do when this happens. And they know they can't predict a damn thing. They know that maybe they can be 51% right. So if you can be 51% right, and that's all you can be, then how, how can you play this game? How can you bet effectively? And that's, that's a real different way of thinking because I think most people really grow up with the you know, they grew up with the idea that, my gosh, I can turn on the TV and look at those four guys in $3,000 suits, and they look so exciting, and yeah. their hair is so perfect, and their voices are just so beautiful. And look at them, and they've got so much energy. They must know what they're doing, <laughs> right? So, I mean, what was it then that Richard Dennis did that was, according to his own model, replicable? A set of rules. He gave these students a set of rules, a set of rules that said, okay, here are the markets you're going to trade. So a finite grouping of markets, the big markets that everyone knows, the, the big stocks, the big metals, the big currencies. Then he said, okay, here's your entry method. You're going to enter on a momentum type indicator. Then he said, okay, when do you get out? Because you got to get out, you got to exit with either a loss or a gain. So that was two more rules right there. The final rule was, how much do you bet? I mean, if you ask anybody out in the audience and you say, okay, how much money do you got? Someone says, I've got $100,000 or I've got a million dollars. Okay, you've now got a trade to put on. How much of that, let's say million dollars, are you going to bet? You gonna bet 1%, 5%, 10%? If you bet 10, 10% and you blow it out, your million dollars is gone. So the idea is you have to put yourself in a position to bet conservatively until the trend starts to go your way. And this is the mentality. Again, it, it really is analogous to, as I mentioned, venture capital. Um, the betting team from MIT had the same strategy in Vegas. The film production company in Los Angeles Blumhouse Productions, they do the same thing. They say, okay, let's make 10 movies and we're going to spend a million dollars on each movie and we know nine of these movies are going to lose money, but the 10th movie is going to be Paranormal Activity. That's going to make $200 million. It will pay for our nine losses and we'll get gains. The whole mentality is based on that no one can predict a damn thing. 
So Bill Eckhart has gone on the record as saying that Richard Dennis had this rare skill and that skill was inherent. So to what degree do you think that that remains the case, that Dennis did possibly unknowingly, what he did was recruit people that he could see himself in? I think that might be a stretch. And I think over time, Bill Eckhart has come to see also that you can give, you know, an otherwise pretty smart person a set of rules and say, here's how it works. Now you have to follow them. Now, look, if you look out there in the world, if you look at the population of people, most people really probably don't want to work that hard. They don't really want to stick with the rules. Going to Vegas is more fun. Rolling the dice is more fun. But for those people out there that say, oh, are you telling me that there is a serious way, if I'm a serious person, I can go about this? Well, there is. The question becomes, in a population, how many people really want to be serious versus trying to get rich quick overnight? I mean, because as you and I both know, the vast majority of people that are looking for investment advice are trying to figure out how they can day trade the pound mm. all day long. And that's clearly just gambling. Yeah. So, I mean, Dennis, he was already a very successful and wealthy trader. That's how he got his name, the Prince of the Pits. I mean, he allocated students his own money to trade his system of trend following. How different do you think the outcome could have been if he insisted that the turtles used their own money? That's a good question. I'm sure it would have been different because they didn't have the confidence. But now on the flip side, he kind of, I guess the phrase I've seen some people use, uh, he wasn't calling them dumb, but he said, you know, I want dumb stumps, meaning do exactly what you're told. So he told them, here are your rules. Here is the money. Now you follow the rules exactly, or we take the money away from you and you go home. So if somebody doesn't have experience, if they don't understand the game, yeah, it could be difficult. You know, if you've got your own money in there and you think to yourself, oh, I've got these great rules, I'm going to follow them until Thursday comes along and there's a Fed announcement and I feel nervous and now I feel like my intuition is greater than the rules and I will now apply my intuition and my intuition will be better than the rules. And then the next thing you know, you blow your account out and you wonder, how did Richard Dennis make the money? Yeah, well, that kind of leads me on to my next point, actually, which is, I mean, the fact that Dennis didn't always perform well and he lost a lot of money later on in his career, reportedly because he didn't follow his original ideas. So of those that Dennis took under his wing, there were, of course, some that did exceptionally well. But what's your impression of the exercise overall? Well, I think you make a great point, And I put this in my book. I disclose fully Rich Dennis's up and downs. And it did look like Perhaps for, I don't want to say boredom, it could have been boredom. Mm -hmm. You know, a guy's done so well for so long and he's trying new things out. And this is a little bit before that everyone understood how valuable something like trend following could be in the institutional money world. I mean, look, because in a perfect world, Rich Dennis should have just said, hey, all you turtles, you stay working for me and we're going to go manage money for all the big pensions around the world. And he might be one of the richest guys in the world today. So he, it was just a little bit early before he understood how valuable it could be. For example, there's a great trader in London who did understand how great trend following could be, and he became the biggest trend following trader, and his name is David Harding. Mm. So it also seems that Dennis's returns were influenced by the business cycle. When we look at when he did make those losses, one time was during the crash in the 80s, and the second time was during the dot-com bubble as well. So, I mean, what can be learned about this experiment when it comes to sort of tying that in with the business cycle? I don't know if I would use the phrase business cycle. I see where you're going there. I might phrase it a little bit more like uh, black swan or crisis alpha. You know, when things really hit the fan, mm -hmm. when the so-called proverbial hits the fan, this style of strategy does really well because if the vast majority of players out there are long only, and they're just trusting, you know, regurgitated fundamental advice, and they're just in a, a long-only mutual fund. When things happen unexpectedly, like the time periods you mentioned, all markets will move because people start running for the exits. So if you have a strategy that's based on being in all markets, all big markets, and when the vast majority of players start to panic and run, 
you're in a great position to take advantage of that. So yeah, trend following has historically done exceptionally well when the vast majority of people are really getting uh, getting clocked, so to speak. And I also wanted to ask you what you think would happen if we did the experiment today. I mean, do you think he'd have the same success or has the environment of you know, 24 hour news, social media, and perhaps more importantly, algorithmic trading change things to the point where markets have lost that un- underlying character of identifiable predictability of, in this case, a trend? Well, I don't know if predictable would be the word, but I think markets will always be volatile. Markets are made up of people. So as long as people are in the game, you're going to have a chance. So if you repeated the experiment today, I don't necessarily know that just because social media is spewing a million times more data points of fundamental analysis per day, you still, the only data point you're following as a trend following trader is the price data. So all that other stuff you're not looking at. So you're only looking at the price data. If the price data is moving or not moving, that's your decision cue. The other stuff is not relevant. Now, you can can say, well, hold on. What has happened since Rich Dennis? Well, he wasn't the only trend-following trader. His students were not the only trend-following trader. I mentioned a big London trader. The guy that owns the Boston Red Sox, the Liverpool football team, made his money to buy those sports teams as a trend-following trader, trading just like the Turtles. So uh, it's it's something that has endured. And I think as long as people are in the game, as long as people and their craziness to get rich and rolling their dice and betting their capital are in the game, I think we're going to have something. And one more point, too, on the algorithmic part. Mm-hmm. Trend-following could be algorithmic. Look, because if you've got a set of rules that you can quantify, you can put those into a spreadsheet, you can put those in a trade station, it doesn't make a difference. So I think sometimes sometimes phrases like that might get a little jargony to my ears. And finally, how much do you think this story is really about human psychology rather than actually trading in the markets? I think it's both. I think it's both. Absolutely. I mean, if Daniel Kahneman can win the Nobel Prize for behavioral finance, he won it for the reason the turtles were successful for prospect theory, the whole idea of you know, loss aversion, the idea that, hey, let's cut your losses. So that's, that's deeply rooted in personal psychology. Most people don't want to cut their losses. Most people want to hang on because they know deep in their gut it's going to come back. Of course, it often doesn't. So yeah, you, you make a strong point in the sense that it's absolutely a great trading story with great evidence, but it also shows us that we're human. And if we are human, What's the best strategy? I mean, that's what I would challenge your audience to think about. If you're human, I think we still all are. What is your best strategy going forward? Is your best strategy going forward to just trust the system that markets will only go up and you can be long and you don't have to think? Or will you need something else? Or has the system, you know, have, has the system gotten rid of all of those October 2008s never to appear again? Mm-hmm. Questions that everyone has to think about. Michael, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. That was Michael Koval, the author of The Complete Turtle Trader. I'm Victoria Scholar, and thanks for listening to IG's Trading the Markets.